Okay, this is the 27th lecture of a 41 lecture series on creating a sustainable international civilization. So the previous lecture was about toxic culture and about how greed in the US has led to the corruption of our food system and the corruption of our mental, creating a toxic culture, which truly drives people mentally ill. So people's physical and mental illnesses are actually a feature of our culture. They're not a glitch. The society is set up to hack into our physical system, our dopamine um, system in our brain that controls our pleasures and pains and makes us sick, makes us physically sick and mentally sick, um, unstable and unable to have, be, have contentment and um, which is driven by serotonin. Uh, so, so that's corruption. Now, the next few slides or the next few lectures are about um, the prophets, the prophetic traditions. So these are the icons of all the traditions in Panchasila number one. And the first lecture is about that they all have Aristotle's virtues. Um, and the virtue of loving justice, a natural standard of justice, necessarily leads to a calling out of corruption. And so all of these icons called out the corruption, the abuses of power, the injustices, rule for the sake of the ruler, instead of rule for the sake of the ruled in the societies where they lived. And because the societies were unjust, they all were pers persecuted. So, um, so they, and so in the Judeo-Christian tradition and in Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition, we would call these people prophets. Um, but Socrates, you know, he just said he lived the life of the mind, and that's what drove him to call out the, the corruption. So um, the first one is, well, what is a prophet? What are the patterns? What do they all have in common? Um, and then that would explain why Ponchasilla principle number one is a good principle, and we should, it's a good foundation for a culture, civilization, as long as people don't become intolerant, which is happening all over the world. Religion is used as a weapon, but there's no reason. And there's there's a reason why Ponchasil is fine, as long as you know what's going on. Okay, so the series of lectures, or this section of the series of lectures, will focus on how the traditions in Ponchasil of one have an iconic figure, a person whose way of life embodied Aristotle's virtues and also who is or should be part of the longstanding prophetic tradition. A prophet exercises all of the personal and social virtues, but he or she is most recognized for their impact on political life. These icons were not necessarily powerful themselves, but they stood up to the establishment, those with power. They exposed their corruption. The leaders persecuted them for this, but their lives left behind a legacy for future generations. We also should live virtuously and expose the corruption of our own leaders. So I'm using the categories of Houston Smith in his book, The World Religions, and many quotes from his book, because it shows the similarities between the various traditions and the way of life of each icon as he describes as he describes it fits well with Aristotle's virtues. In, in his chapter on Buddha, Smith describes six aspects of religion. First, authority. Each religion has its authorities who teach the basic doctrines and run the institutions institutions. 
rituals. Each tradition has its own rituals, rites of passage, coming of age for young people, birth, adulthood, marriage, death, etc. Each religion has speculation. It has its intellectual elite who supposedly understand the nature of the universe in ways the believer does not. Believers are asked to accept it. Each tradition had this esoteric knowledge. The tr it has tradition. The accumulated wisdom is passed down from one generation to the next. Grace. Each religion provides some kind of hope, some way for believers to create a better future. And mystery. Each religion postulates an infinite, a force or power beyond the human mind. Uh, the prophets who stood up to the authorities, Socrates, every day you should examine yourself and each other asking, what is justice? What is virtue? What is the good life? And how should I live? An unexamined life is not worth living. It's this kind of examination, which a democracy provides the opportunity for citizens to examine themselves, whereas an authoritarian government does not. And it's a responsibility. You will lose your democracy unless you live an examined life. So the Oracle of Delphi, which um, represented international justice, international standards over and above whatever any particular ruler says. The oracle said no one is wiser than Socrates. It did not say that Socrates is wise. Socrates said, the only wisdom I have is that when I do not know something, I do not think I know either. Everyone I talk to. So when the oracle said that, Socrates, who was just a stone cutter, went around asking people what they knew. So he asked political leaders, what is justice? He asked military leaders, what is courage? He asked um, uh, teachers who preached about virtue, what is virtue? He asked teachers, well, what is education? He asked artists, well, what is beauty? <laughs> what is art? And um, he asked people who recite Homer for a living, well, what are the messages in Homer? And it turns out they couldn't answer them. But they didn't want to admit they didn't know. So Socrates just says, everyone I talk to thinks he knows more than he knows. He then goes on to make serious mistakes about how to live and how to lead the city. And each one of them contributed to the downfall of Athens and the downfall, these types of people making these types of mistakes will contribute to the downfall of any democracy. So the only thing Socrates knows is that he, when he doesn't know, he admits it and he seeks wisdom. So he loves wisdom. He is not wise, but he loves wisdom. He understands how important it is for us to keep seeking wisdom or we'll lose our democracy. Confucius lived in the era of the warring states. Civilization had broken down. The powerful forced the powerless to eat soup made from the bodies of their family members. Confucius was a social genius. He created a tradition, which is sort of a, a contradiction. He referred back to the good old days or the golden age of China, and he created a model of the ideal, real Chinese person. So he lived out that ideal, and he inspired the Chinese to follow it, even when that wasn't the way the people in front of their face were acting. He was a visionary. He gave them a vision of a better life. He referred to the past in order that they could create a better future. His vision was based on the five relationships, husband, wife, parent, child, older sibling, younger sibling, ruler ruled, 
elder friend, younger friend. Uh, he wanted to be a counselor to leaders, but he was rejected and almost killed because he didn't flatter them. He told them if he thought they were corrupt. The Hindu tradition and Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Hinduism is the oldest wisdom tradition. It's very tolerant of any different ways of finding the inner Atman, the peace of the divine within each person. The spiritual quest is to find this infinite within, either through reflection, relationships, actions, or meditation, or some combination of all of them. For a Hindu, the icons of the other traditions are all leaders on different paths to the same goal, which is positive karma and linking what's within to the universe. Arjuna's cousins committed a great crime. It was his religious duty to fight against them to bring back positive karma. He did not want to, but Vishnu in the form of Krishna convinced him he needed to stay detached and not to get his ego involved. So in dangerous situations when people threaten each other, harm each other, you have to fight back, but avoid becoming aggressive. Um, this is the, the virtue of courage, not knowing how to relate to dangerous situations appropriately. Buddha. Buddha left home to seek liberation following the Hindu tradition, but eventually he got discouraged. The Hindu Brahmin class was corrupt. The caste system perpetuated a centralization of wealth and power among a small elite, destroying any authentic spiritual life. Buddha rejected the Brahmin's authority, saying anyone could reach nirvana. He rejected the traditional rituals in favor of meditation practices. He rejected elite intellectual speculation in favor of the experience of liberation. He rejected tradition. He rejected external grace or karma and for karma. And he rejected mystery and replaced all of them with a system of meditation that could lead anyone to nirvana in this life. Jesus and the prophetic tradition. Jesus was born into a tradition, Judaism, that had a long history of prophets in the Old Testament who called out corruption among the Jews in particular. Jesus called out the corruption of the Sadducees, who were the wealthy Jewish rabbis, because they abused their privilege and did not help lift up uh, the underclass. Jesus called out the Pharisees, who were the fundamentalist rabbis. They thought Jesus needed a spiritual, they thought the Jews needed a spiritual renewal by for, focusing more on literal and rigid adherence to Jewish law. Jesus supported the outcasts and told the religious establishment that the real message of the holy books was to love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Mohammed also rejected the corrupt, the corruption in his society, including religious charlatans who claimed to be able to help people by appealing to their fears and superstitions. Mohammed joined a sect of monotheists who retreated to Mount Hira, where the angel Gabriel dictated the Quran to him. Mohammed also emphasized purity of heart, the inner Quran as more important than the written Quran. He rejected any sources of authority, rituals, speculation, tradition, fatalism in the face of external threats or mystical interventions other than the five pillars. These pillars were dictated by Gabriel as the way to internalize the way of life Jesus also wanted. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. Muhammad's main message, his way of life, is compatible with religious pluralism and humanitarianism. So we need to figure out who are our prophets today? 
And how can each of us be prophets? So the previous lecture, I was calling out the corruption of global capitalism, what it's doing to our bodies, our mental health. Um, but there's plenty of room for more profits because there's plenty of corruption around. We just have to agree on who are the prophets because there's many false prophets also. Um, and that was true in Jesus' time. That was true in Confucius' time. There were lots of people claiming to have insight of wisdom, to speak truth to power. But the ones that have come down in history, there's a pattern of what they have in common. And we have to spot that so that we can know who in our time is an authentic prophet and who might be a tragic character who has good intentions but has really been deceived and who is a is cynical uh, read a cynical false witness um uses the prophetic tradition to gain power and wealth or power and wealth for his family or friends it's just hard um and all the all the stories of these people are stories where there are also false prophets. People disagree. It's not easy. But at the end of the day, we can figure it out.